Right. That darkening on the stage was my cue to come across. I was just telling some friends that a fellow that I have known for the last 20 years as Max, and he's not in this room so I can talk about him while you're not hearing him, Max actually has a real name and I haven't known that for 20 years. How's that? He's got a little name tag with his real live name. I said, did you pretend to be someone else to come here? He said, no, that is my real name. Regardless of how you get in here, you've done well because we maxed out on delegates this year and we had to turn people away and we maxed out on the stage here as well and we maxed out outside. If you haven't had a chance yet, we pegged that new little bit of ground out there, the Harbour Masters area, so make sure you go out and you see those uh, teams and companies that are out there with booze as well and make sure you speak to their geos and the people that are passionate about what they do. Right, my bartering power for this last session of power involves gold bars. I went to get the real gold bar, the $1.4 million gold bar has left with management. So I've got you some gold chocolate bars though, so there you go. Now, my first speaker in this session is the definition of experience. And we've talked a lot about how important it is to have someone with, with experience to lead teams, especially when they're doing something a little bit new and a little bit innovative. Tom Davidson, do you wanna come up here, sir? So we're going to talk about the ACDC experience and Tom is leading the team. Let's find out what he has that might tickle your interest as investors. Please make him welcome. Thanks Chrissy. Um, thank you all and uh, good afternoon. Uh, we're very pleased to be here today and, and to share with you the ACDC story and uh, why we're worth a closer look and I hope you all agree our name is a memorable one um, and uh, I hope you, you find our stories as well. Please take note. Move on. Uh, so the, the ACDC strategy uh, is completely connected to the energy transition, uh, supplying materials for the efficient low carbon capture and storage of energy. Uh, we aren't the first ones trying to achieve this, of course. Um, it's a massive opportunity for Australia uh, and our investors like yourselves. Our aim is to be supplier of separated rare earth elements within Australia using innovative technology and using the mineral monazite as a byproduct for mineral sands mining. Australia has the opportunity to be part of the downstream value uh, adding processing and we're excited to be paying our part. So why ACDC metals? So as I just mentioned, we've got that exposure to the energy transition. Um, we listed last year, January of uh, 2023, and we've been hitting our milestones since then. So we completed over 13,000 metres last year, released at Jordan at Maiden Jork Resource at Goshen Central, over 600 million tonnes in the ground. Our scoping studies started last October. Uh, we're going through the final reviews of them now, and we'll be excited to release them to the market uh, shortly. And we're still well financed. We've still got nearly 5 million cash in the bank. Uh, with a plan for this year, uh, we can well and truly execute that. And obviously our key differentiator is the rare earth uh, processing plant, where we take the mineral monazite and start that downstream value add processing to reduce and mix rare earth carbonate. So a good experience board and management team uh, in project development and also in the rare earths, which is not always that easy to find. A corporate structure. So this is the key one to sort of point out we've got nearly 5 million in the bank, we're at cash backing, um, the amount of work that we've achieved over the last year and how we sit amongst our peers, as we'll demonstrate in the next few slides, um, you know, we're, we're a really good look at. So what are mineral sands and what, and what are the key things to sort of focus on? So with our process plant, we'll be producing a heavy mineral concentrate. So that's the zircon and the titanium minerals. Uh, and importantly, and I guess what's become of a focus in these last sort of three, four years with the critical minerals push is the monazite and xenotime. So that's the rare earth concentrate. Um, you know, five, six, seven years ago, that was only sort of $500 a tonne. And now it's last year, it was up to the heights of, you know, 10,000. And that's what's really grabbed the focus of these mineral sands projects. And so what is the ACDC metal strategy? So we have our tenements in Western Victoria. Uh, we've been drilling them. And the plan is to then produce, uh, to build a process plant in Victoria to produce the, the heavy mineral concentrate and the rare earth concentrate. We would then take that to our downstream value add um, processing plant. Uh, we be a separate plant and we also would have the opportunity to uh, import monazite if need be, um, which could, provides us that flexibility. And obviously the, the key thing which gets everyone excited and when we talk to the different departments of the states, um, you know, we going there is the first step of producing the mixed rare earth carbonate is then the idea of creating a hub and you get those next six, um, sequential steps towards magnet uh, manufacture. 
So our mineral sands projects, so as you can see there, we're in good company. Uh, you know, there's an ex Luca operations. We also have the, you know, the three names there, VHM, Astron and WIM. They're all at FID right now. Uh, they've all got, you know, 80 to $120 million market caps. They're all um, reporting their NPVs of high eight, $900 million uh, projects. And so what we have in the ground here is exactly the same. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we're a fast coming second. Uh, so as you can see, last year we, we did complete over the nearly 13,000 metres. Uh, we're back drilling now. We started about two or three weeks ago. Uh, we're shoring up, going back into Goshen, targeting a few key areas uh, where the geos got excited. Um, and we're also going to go and look at a couple other um, tenements as well where um, we sort of found some opportunities as well. So the maiden resource that we released uh, in October, November last year, uh, so 620 million tonnes a key amount of uh, you know, indicated 130 million tonnes. Uh, so as we've been going through our scoping study and, and our mineral, uh, sorry, our mining optimizations, we're getting a high portion of indicated uh, material coming through, which gives us great confidence that we can quickly go into that pre-feasibility into that next phase. Um, and important to note that is our, the trio makeup of um, the magnetic rare earth oxide. So we've got a 21%, which is a good, good significant portion. And those four, um, rare earth elements, the praetisium, neodymium, dysposium, terbium, uh, you know, they're the real money makers and that's what you want to have as much as possible in there. And the upside, so, you know, we've still, it's still open uh, on three sides. And so we're, that's where we're going back in now and, and drilling on that sort of uh, right-hand side there of the indicated zone. Um, and also importantly to note is the resource has been based on a 38 micron to one mil, which um, with mineral technologies and the, um, technology advancements in the spiral technology, we're able to get that finer fraction, so down to 20 micron. Um, so obviously that would increase head grade and you know, grade is king. Uh, so when we do some, you know, compare it well against our, our peers, um, so zircon, monazite, xenotime, which are the key, key um, assemblage that you really want to look at, um, you know, we, we peg well against them. Um, and so that's why, you know, when we sort of try and draw these comparisons between the, the guys that are at FID and where we are right now, that's the real uplift that we see in the company right now. And as we move forward in this next quarter, with lots of news flow coming through, and that's where we, um, you know, hope to see that value add. So our scoping studies that are underway right now, um, you know, we're seeing, given those that vast amount of tonnes, when we run these um, the mining optimizations, you know, we're seeing multi-decade operation at Goshen Central. Um, and we have the ability to be able to target the high grade zones and, and really get the economic returns. And these projects, you know, in capturing all infrastructure. So they're everything from, from woe to go um, to get these projects going. Um, and also importantly, when we did the drilling last year, we captured an additional two and a half tonnes worth of material that we could send through the pilot plant. And that's happening right now as we speak. And so within about a month's time, we'll be able to then produce our full suite of products out of the mineral sands operations. So the monazite, xenotime, and your heavy mineral suite. Uh, and then we can really start then doing quality testing, talking to off-takers. Um, and then also importantly is then go and take that monazite and go and talk to the likes of Amsto and, um, and be able to get that next phase of our caustic crack processing plant going and, um, and really push towards development of that. Uh, so as I mentioned here for the rare earth processing plant, we've got over nearly over six years worth of test work um, and, and development that has been occurring. Um, our scoping study is nearing completion on that as well, and it's really going to be a vertically integrated operation where you take the go from the mineral sands operation into the um, into the rare earth piece, and we can really um, upscale it. And so, with the caustic crack process we've gone with, the key things that are really to note is the ESG advantages, so the waste minimisation um, and the ability to separate out these future products, which at this stage might be contained into the waste streams, but we have the ability to pull them out. Um, and so, that's really the, the sort of exciting part for us. Um, so the work plan for calendar year 2024. Um, so we've got lots of lots of work underway right now, um, and so we're really hoping we'll be able to provide shareholders and, and potential investors with the lots of news flow and, and you know provide that upside for the company. So our drill program is underway right now, uh, that we'll be targeting to complete about seven and a half thousand meters across our three projects. Uh, so assay results will be trickling back in, um, but the the results really from the the Goshen Central stuff. Um, will enable us to probably uh, go along and do a jork update middle of the year. And so we're really, we're not really chasing more tons. We've got enough of that. It's really trying to push up that grade and 
you know, if you look in the financial model, grades king. If you can, um, if you can get that through, scoping studies out in the next, you know, short period, um, and that will really enable us to talk numbers, even though it's a scoping study. Uh, it will really enable us to be able to benchmark ourselves, um, and then really then getting this the uh, products through from mineral technologies uh, pilot plant, and then we got to start the process with um, with Ansto, and really working towards that that piece of. Um, the rare earth plant, which is really what gets everyone sort of starts the discussions and gets everyone really excited. And so just in summary, why, why ACDC? So we've got a strong team of, of project development in this space, plenty of cash to go. We're at cash backing. Uh, we've been executing our plan. Uh, we've done lots of drilling, resource out, studies underway, and, um, and we're right in the heart of this energy transition and, and providing that, that piece for the, for the market. All right, thank you very much. And thanks for your support. All right, first one with a gold bar, 30 seconds to go. Congratulations, big ACDC. First time I've been on there time, you, go. I think. you could play some of the song on the way out. All right, we talked, um, when Adam came up earlier today from BDO, he talked to us about mergers and acquisitions and what they mean. So, oh, I'm going to take that time off you. You've left something up there. He talked about mergers and acquisitions and what they meant for companies. So one company which has got very recent experience of this, if you've been watching the news flow for Greenstone, um, you will know that Greenstone Resources has had a very, very busy week in such a field. How are you going, Christopher Hansen? It has been a, uh, a very busy couple of weeks, and it's was... been a, a process that's almost been uh, six months in the making since uh, Digs and Dealers uh, okay. done last year. So, right, um... we are interested to hear more. Would you put your hands together and make him welcome, please? Thank you. Yeah, look, good afternoon, everybody. And look, today we're incredibly excited to be sharing a uh, very significant milestone uh, in the journey of both Greenstone Resources and Horizon Minerals, namely the proposed merger between the two entities, which was announced yesterday. We believe that the combination of these two complementary assets will serve to expedite our path to becoming the next near-term gold producer. At the heart of this merger is the establishment of an entity with a total gold resource inventory exceeding 1.8 million ounces in gold in the Kalgoorlie region of Western Australia. This combined resource base is supported by two cornerstone assets, namely Greenstone's high-grade Burbank's gold asset and Horizon's baseload Barora gold project. The combined asset portfolio, including the two cornerstone assets, serves to support the revised dual track strategy. Firstly, focusing on imminent low capital cash flow opportunities through joint venture mining operations, which will then ultimately support the expedited development of our two long life and cornerstone assets. This merger isn't just a combination of assets, it's both a strategic and highly complementary consolidation. The merger between Greenstone and Horizon brings four key synergies, namely resources, land holding, strength in the balance sheet and management skills and expertise. Firstly, on resources, the merged entity will have a total uh, global resource of 1.8 million ounces, located in the heart of the Kalgoorlie gold fields and supported by a wealth of regional infrastructure. Secondly, is land holding. The merged entity will have the third largest land holding in the region, second only to Northern Star and Orobanda. Thirdly, the balance sheet as at the end of the December quarter, uh, for the combined groups had cash and listed investments of around $14.9 million, leaving us well positioned to execute on our revised strategy. And finally, management. A lot of the time in these uh, mergers and consolidations, the management uh, structure can be quite contentious. In the case of both Greenstone and Horizon, we had two very complementary management team, teams with Greenstone being very much focused on exploration and resource growth and Horizon being focused uh, on mine development and production. Moving forward, uh, Grant uh, Haywood will be the CEO and Managing Director, and myself, I'll step into a non-executive role on the board. So what does this all mean? And importantly, what does it mean for Greenstone shareholders? The merger will be affected via a scheme of arrangement process, whereby Horizon will acquire all of the ordinary shares and listed options in Greenstone. Importantly for Greenstone shareholders, they'll receive 0.2 mine Horizon shares for every Greenstone share held. This implies an 89% premium to the last traded price of Greenstone before going into the trading halt last Thursday. 
For Greenstone shareholders, this will result in us owning 36.9% of the merged group post completion. And as I mentioned earlier, the merged board of directors will comprise three Horizon nominees and one from Greenstone being myself. Oh, uh, finally, the, uh, the merger carries the full support of the Greenstone team uh, at board and management, uh, and the completion schedule is scheduled for mid-June this year. There are a number of key shareholder benefits to both Greenstone and Horizon shareholders. For Greenstone, the key benefits are access to Horizon's significant resource base of 1.3 million ounces, as well as the merger being priced at a significant premium. And it brings the strength of Horizon's balance sheet to execute on this revised dual track strategy. For Horizon, the key benefits are access to Greenstone's high grade Burbank's gold assets, which serves to lift their global resource grade from 1.7 grams per tonne to 1.9 grams per tonne. And included within that is a pipeline of near term mining opportunities. However, the real strength of the merger comes from the complementary nature of all of the assets in the portfolio, namely, the combination of Greenstone's high grade gold resources combined with Horizon's base load feed and their dominant regional land position and exploration potential. Beyond the strength and balance sheet and the management composition, the core value of this transaction inherently lies in the complementary nature of these assets and what options that does afford to the merge group moving forward into the future. Principally, it serves to provide the ability for us to be able to expedite that path to commercial production. What Greenstone brings is our flagship Burbank's Gold project, where over the past three years, we've grown the resource from just 140,000 ounces to over 465,000 ounces. And we're just getting started here with only 30% of the upper 500 metre horizon having been explored to date. This is a high grade share hosted gold system, which still remains open in all directions. What Horizon brings is an extensive portfolio of advanced stage projects with significant growth potential. Horizon is underpinned by their cornerstone Barara asset, which hosts over 450,000 ounces. Now, this is a very simple slide. The merge groups will have simply lots and lots of gold. In fact, well over 1.8 million ounces. On completion of the merger, the company will adopt the dual track growth strategy. The, nickel, the initial focus being on the generation of immediate low capital cash flow through toll processing and mining joint ventures. This cash flow will ultimately serve to underpin and support the expedited development of the two cornerstone assets being Burbanks and Barora, while also serving to minimize any future shareholder dilution. The merge group has a very strong pipeline of near surface mining opportunities which are currently being assessed for joint venture mining activities. And I'll touch a little bit further on this shortly. Over the next couple of slides, I just want to give a brief uh, overview uh, on the two cornerstone assets being Burbanks and Barora, the pipeline of near term mining opportunities, and finally touch on the regional exploration potential with the dominant land holding that the merged company will have. Burbanks. Uh, is Greenstone's cornerstone and flagship asset, which we bring to the merger. Having Burbanks has historically produced over 420,000 ounces at 10.9 grams per tonne. However, up until about three years ago, nobody had drilled a hole deeper than 250 metres on this project or explored the full strike horizon. From left to right across the screen here, screen here is a strike horizon of around four and a half kilometres with significant portions which haven't even been drilled below about 150 to 200 metres. The deposit here remains open in all directions and has a track record of continued resource growth. The recent 10,000 metre drill campaign that we completed our last year added well over 180,000 ounces and there's significant potential here for future growth. The Barora asset is Horizon's cornerstone asset, which currently hosts a mineral resource of just over 440,000 ounces. Importantly, 77% of Barora's resources are either indicated or inferred. And this is an asset that's only 50 kilometers away from our flagship Burbanks project. Like Burbanks, this is a large mineral system which remains open along strike and at depth, with known mineralization also existing outside of the current resource area. Importantly, when combined with Burbanks, it's a source of base load feed and supports our aspirational target of the combined entity producing between 60 to 80,000 ounces per annum. 
The merge group will be well placed to take advantage of the high, the high gold price and also the depressed Australian dollar. Both Greenstone and Horizon bring a large number of high grade satellite mining opportunities. While the core focus of the, more, of the merge group will very much remain the development of the two cornerstone assets, we have the ability to generate a source of non-dilutive funding while we continue to de-risk these assets. The near-term mining opportunities are really summarised by these key six projects, but there are a plethora of other projects that also sit within the portfolio. Outside of the Merge Group's two cornerstone projects and a pipeline of near-term development opportunities, the Merge Group also controls the third largest land holding in the region, with real potential for further discoveries and also extensions to existing resources. Thank you all very much for your time and for further information I'd very much encourage you to come by our booth or visit our website. Thank you. Oh, he's left. You don't like chocolate. This is fabulous. I'm doing very well today. I was going to say we'd like one for you yeah, and would you like one for your new partner? I would love one. There you Thank go. You well done. Congratulations, Thank Steve. You. It's great news. All right, team, our next presenter up on stage. Actually, I went looking for our next presenter yesterday. I went out and found his little booth, uh, Jim Malone, SI6, and he wasn't there, but his team was there, and they were very, very excited. And then I finally, by accident, bumped into Jim out in the exhibition hall. He was very, very excited as well. I said, what are you excited about? He said, Chris, you wait. I've got three things I want to tell them, three things. So prepare to be excited everyone and please welcome Jim Malone to the Stone for Store for Explorers. <laughs> thanks very much Chrissy and uh, welcome everybody here and thanks for um, vertical events and for all of you people for turning up today. Uh, it's quite a big day today because it's St Valentine's Day so it's a great day for the Romantics. It's Ash Wednesday so it's a very important day for the religious and it's uh, also uh, SI6 are presenting, so I think it's potentially a great day for anyone who wants to make a bit of money this year because I think we've got a really good opportunity here with the assets that we've got and a dedicated team to, uh, <coughs> to make sure that all our shareholders have a very good year. Uh, SI6, we're a, a, a uh, diversified exploration company that's building a portfolio of critical and precious minerals assets in Brazil Botswana and WA. Just a quick company overview. Capital structure, we've got 2.2 billion shares on issue. We've got a market cap of $11 million. So we're a small, small market cap. Uh, we've got an experienced board of directors. Um, if you look at our share price there, it's certainly when we announced our Brazilian deal, it certainly went the right direction. We've come back like a lot of companies that are dealing in rare earths and lithium, but I think neither of those commodities are going away, so I'm sure they're all going to have their day at some stage. Uh, and we've also got a gold asset, and I think it's going to be a pretty good year for gold as well. So what's the investment proposition? We're targeting critical minerals in tier one mining jurisdictions, and we've also got a 100% gold asset in WA for a strategic play. In Brazil, we just recently uh, concluded an acquisition of a 50% interest in a suite of projects uh, which are mainly in the Minas Gerais state of Brazil. Um, we have uh, a rare earth project. We've got 10 licenses, seven of them are Minas Gerais. The other three are in, in two other parts of Brazil, which I'll show you a map very quickly. Um, one of the uh, projects, uh, the licenses, two of the licenses are in the south of Brazil in the Caldera region, which is very close to, and in fact, one of our projects is alongside uh, Meteorics project down there. And there, the, uh, the clay rare earths, and the, it's also nearby to uh, VMM, who have uh, been quite successful. And both those companies have had stellar runs over the last 18 months, I think, um, Certainly, Meteorics gone from you know very low market cap to 450 million, and think might have been over half a billion at one stage. And VMM's had a good run as well. We've also got uh, f five licenses in the Lithium Valley, which is up to the um, up in the northern part of um, of uh, Minas Gerais. And again, we're very close to Sigma's rather large. They're a two and a half billion dollar. Canadian uh, lithium producers started producing last year 
and also quite close to a number of uh, the licenses held by Latin Resources, who presented today, who have also had a very, very successful last 18 months uh, with their value. Um, so we've got a large uh, land holding there. There's 17,000 hectares. Our second project is we've, which is the historic project of the company, is uh, nickel and copper in uh, Botswana. And there's three projects there. We just completed about a two million dollar drilling program uh, on our three projects that we own 65 percent of in a JV in Botswana. We had some pretty good results on the copper and also on the nickel project, which is the Maybelli North, which actually already has a resource and we'd be hope to building on that when we get the results in. Our third project is a gold project in Leonora. I'll get onto that later. It's got significant exploration potential. It's got a resource of 154,000 ounces and it's strategically located. Just a sort of overall strategy on that, we're gonna be focusing on Brazil this year. We're only a small company with limited funds, so we can't do everything. With, um, with Botswana and, and in Brazil, we'll start, we'll probably be focused really on the, the licenses in Minas Gerais, which will start in the Caldera region of Minas Gerais. And look, Minas Gerais is like WA, it's a great mining area, it's got great infrastructure, very low energy costs, it's a great place to do mining. There's, 300 mining operations there. So it's a really mature mining place. We're very comfortable being there. That's going to be our focus this year. With Botswana, we'll probably get assess the drilling results, see how they go, look at increasing our resource at Mobelli, and also possibly look at getting a joint venture partner to take over that the spend on that, because obviously it's, there's a couple of pretty big projects there that it's going to take a bit of money to develop but we're pretty confident we can do that. And the gold project, uh, we love the gold project, but it deserves a lot more love than what we can probably give it at the moment. So we're looking to do something strategic with that, either spin it out or enter into a JV with that, because that one is a great project, but it just it's just not gonna get the, the due attention that it probably deserves off SI6 this year. So we wanna value, we wanna make the most for our shareholders. So that that's sort of the overall strategy there. Moving on from the uh, the uh, proposition of the investment, we think we're in the right place. Brazil's terrific with lithium rare earth, uh, Minas Gerais, we're in the Caldera, we're located next to some really exciting companies that have had exciting um, discoveries in the right place. Uh, Botswana is a terrific place to do business and of course WA, the gold fields, is as good a place to do any gold work as you could find in the world. This is our 2004, 24 program. What I was getting to, we've got a $1 million exploration program for the calendar year in 2024, focusing initially on the, our Caldera rare earth clay absorption project, which actually started, we, com we signed the deal on Friday and we had people on the ground on Saturday. One of the great and we've already done some of the um, geochemistry work there. We've commenced that already. One of the good things about the joint venture agreement is that our joint venture partners, Foxfire Metals, have been in Brazil for 10 years. They've got a very experienced team, um, a number of good geologists and people with great relationships with the locals and also with the government, but also technically very sound. And they're our team. So we haven't had to go and find a new team over there. So that's the program there. Eventually we'll move up to the Lithian Valley and we'll, um, we'll work on our five licenses there with geochem programs, a priority over the lithium and rare earth areas. Up in the Lithium Valley, even though it's called the Lithium Valley, we're actually looking for lithium and rare earths up there. Botswana, we're gonna assess the drill program across Mabeli North Dibiti and airstrip projects. We'll upgrade the Mabeli North uh, resource um, and identify some projects. And Leonora, as I said, we're just going to try and um, spin that one out. That's where we are in Brazil. As you can see, the Caldera project there. We've got the Lithium Valley. They're going to be the focus of our, of our attention for the next, um, certainly the next 12 months. That's our Caldera project. You can see the, the smaller of the two leases there. That's abutting the meteoric project. Um, in, in the Caldera and Minas Gerais. 
as you can see there, there's sort of the couple of the um, other peers that we have there that have got much higher market cap than we have, and we just hope that we can replicate some of their success in that region. The Lithium Valley is, is up to the north, and you can see the Salinas project, which is Latin resources, and also the project there for, um, for Sigma, which is a large company, and there's a, a list of peers there again, companies with much higher market caps than us. So trying to just replicate what some of these companies have done in the last couple of years. Botswana, as I said, there's our projects there. It's over towards the Zimbabwean side. Plenty of work to do there. A very good nickel project there, we think, and obviously some potential in the copper. I'll just very quickly go to the Monument Gold is, is, is located very close to some big gold projects there in the Laverton area. So five compelling reasons to invest in SI6. We think we've got the right assets. We're in the right location. We've got an aggressive uh, exploration spend coming up. We've got a highly experienced in-country technical team at all our projects, and we've got a small market cap, so we think there's significant upside potential. So thank you very much, and, uh, and I look forward to uh, uh, chatting to you guys at our booth. We're here all day tomorrow. And tomorrow this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> okay. um, right, Andrew. You said thank you before. Don't expand. All right, now, uh, before, oh, it was probably just before Christmas this year, I was reading an article in Stockhead and Guy LePage with his slightly acidic on the rocks column, sorry, Guy, if you're listening, uh, made comment about Taraco Gold. And one of the things that he said as far as, you know, recommendations for light reading over the Christmas period went was the reports that Taraco Gold put out. And I thought, God, why did he say that? There was a method in his madness, and I'm sure you're going to talk more about uh, the company making deals that you uh, did. Is that correct? That's right, Chrissy. All right, I won't give any more away. Would you please, <laughs> make, please make welcome Justin Tremaine, the MD of Taraco Gold, everyone. Well, thank you. Um, I think I've been presenting here now for 15 years across a couple of companies before, uh, both of which turned into very successful, highly profitable gold mining operations. I can assure you I've never been more excited to present today uh, with Taraco recently announcing the proposed acquisition of the Athena Gold Project in Cote d'Ivoire, which I'll run through with you today quickly. I'll just quickly gloss over this. I'm sure you've heard from 100 companies today or, or the last couple of days that they all have good board and management teams. The key takeaway is that we have a track record, not once, but several times taking companies like Taraco through exploration, discovery, feasibility, development into very successful uh, profitable gold mining operations and create a lot of shareholder value. Companies capped at about $70 million. We're well funded, $8 million in the bank, but I'm sure once again you would have heard that every company is well funded. So this week is actually one of the most celebrated weeks in Cote d'Ivoire since its independence from the French almost 65 years ago. Their uh, national football team, the Elephants, were uh, triumphant in the Cup of Nations football. So they beat every other African uh, nation uh, and it's a famous victory for them. We, here in Australia, we talk about the Ashes, the AFL Grand Final, the Melbourne Cup, but having been in Cote d'Ivoire for the last couple of weeks, I can assure you no sporting event in the world creates more passion than the Cup of Nations. And so this is a very important victory for Cote d'Ivoire, making it even more special was Cote d'Ivoire was actually hosting it for the very first time. They defeated Nigeria in the final on Monday morning which is quite symbolic because they're the two dominant powerhouse economies of West Africa. You know, Cote d'Ivoire went through a period of instability about 20 years ago, five to seven year period. And that's not surprising. It had come out of a 30 year stable period under a strong leadership, a president that led the, company, the country through independence. And then there was a jostle for power. And then the last 10 years, the, the country has been the most stable jurisdiction in West Africa. In fact, I'd say all of Africa and has had tremendous economic growth of 6% per annum. And that's led it into being the second largest economy in the region. And without question, the most developed country in the region. I don't think there could be any arguments from anyone that Cote d'Ivoire is the destination of choice for investment in West Africa. And I'd argue for all of Africa. Importantly, the gold industry has played a very important part of that growth. And there's now, as we sit here today, nine operating gold mines in the country. When I sit here next year, there'll be 10 or 11 operating gold mines. In five years' time, I'm very confident that number will be 15 to 20 years, and Taraco will be one of those companies. 
Our project that we're acquiring, we already had a very large position. In fact, Taraco is the largest exploration holder in Cote d'Ivoire. And you can see many of our projects in North Cote d'Ivoire. But what I want to focus on now, which will be the focus for Taraco moving forward, is the acquisition of this Afema Gold project in South East Cote d'Ivoire, down the bottom of that map that you see there in red. You could not find a better located project in West Africa to develop a mine here. This project sits on a highway that runs from Abidjan, the capital, across to the border of Ghana and is the border crossing. Our project sits no more than 10 kilometres off that highway. And it's only about a two hour drive outside of Abidjan, which is the most developed capital in West Africa. Also, we have a hydropower. All of electricity in Cote d'Ivoire is generated through hydropower. In fact, they export electricity to its neighbouring countries. And one of the main hydropower uh, dams or uh, schemes sits on the uh, northwestern margin of our project area. So we have high voltage transmissions lines running all across our property, no issues with power and access, which are the most important two infrastructure ingredients in developing a gold mine. But it's the geology that is most exciting about this project. This project's never really sat in a public company before. It's always been in a private ownership but it's always been a project that is of interest to the majors. And that's because it's where three of Ghana's world-class gold belts converge together across the border in Southeast Cote d'Ivoire. I don't think you can find a better place on the planet of West Africa to find big large scale gold deposits. And where you have three proven world-class gold uh, structures coming together, it is the ingredients for a major gold system here. But this is not potential that we're talking about. There's been over 250,000 metres of drilling undertaken on that red licence in the middle there, which is a granted mining permit, which comes with a mining convention attached to that with a tax regime locked in place. And of that 200,000 metres, that's only drilled one structure, and there's historic N43 101 resources, which prove this, not potential, but proven to a multi-million ounce gold deposit uh, that we've got here, and that will grow in much, much larger, as I'll show you. So as I said, it represents the extension of three belts. In yellow here, you can see two of those belts running through that red mining, granted mining permit. The northern belt we call the Afema Shear, and that's where all of the historic 250,000 metres of drilling has been undertaken, and that's defined and delineated about 12 deposits, which I'll quickly run through. And then recently there was a new discovery made on a north-south structure running off that Afema Shear called the Wulawulu deposit where there's been about 20,000 metres of diamond drilling, and that's a very significant deposit, as I'll show you. And then we've got another structure to the south we call the Nima Lesser um, shear zone, which represents another one of those Ghanaian belts extending into Cote d'Ivoire. This one has amazing soil geochemistry across it, a lot of artisanal mining activity, but not a single drill hole across it. And there's about 15 to 20 kilometres of strike sitting within our tenure there. So just touching this new discovery, which was made a few years ago and hasn't been um, followed up in the last couple of years, just because the project stuck, stuck in a, an ownership dispute. The Wooloo Wooloo discovery has been a lot of diamond drilling on there that's been drilled on 40 metre spacing, over 2.9 kilometres of strike in, that you can see in the long section here. And it's only been drilled from surface down to about 120 metres. What makes this such an attractive deposit is the width and consistency of mineralization. So look at some of these intersections here, you know, plus 60 metres at over a grams per tonne. And over that 2.9 kilometres on 40 metres um, sections, I could reel off 100 intercepts like that. It's very consistent from section to section. So bulk mining of this, of this mineralization from surface with a very, very low strip ratio. And we'll be looking to extend that down to about 200 metres and come out with a maiden jork resource for Wooloo Wooloo within the first six months of ownership of this project. And in parallel to that, we'll also come out with a maiden jork resource of this historic drilling that's been undertaken along the Afema Shear, as I said, over 200,000 metres of drilling. And that drilling is focused across a series of deposits. Many of those deposits will join up with more drilling. It's about 20 kilometres of strike of this shear. But, but the two main deposits, which I'd quickly touch on, Junction in the north and Anuri, to show you the grade and the potential of this system we're on here. You know, the junction deposit there, what you see in purple is a five gram ore shoot, and they're not typos, 40 metres at seven grams, 24 metres at 10 grams, 14 metres at 10 grams, and so forth. It's super high grade, well over 700,000 ounces already drilled out there. The Anuri deposit there, similar amount, six, 700,000 ounces already drilled out there. 
And once again, many plus 100 gram meter intersections there over a strike length of about 500 meters. So only being drilled down to 300 meters, but the drilling's being done. There's been over $60 million spent on this project today. And then the Nima Lesser Shear, another structure. In fact, this looks better to the south, but it's had no drilling here. You can see some uh, orpiage or artisanal mining activity there. And you'd see it's got anomalous gold in soils along the whole strike of 20 kilometers there. This Afanu target to the south, just off the mining license within the expiration tenure, there's trenching there of 10 to 20 metres at two grams per tonne. In fact, channel sampling across an artisanal pit, you know, returned over 35 metres at over four grams per tonne. This has not been drilled, not a single hole put into it. And this sits about seven kilometres away from those previous resources that have already been drilled, which I just mentioned. So unbelievable exploration within a five to 10 kilometre radius, but then stepping out further, wrapping around a big intrusion as these belts wrap around that intrusion. We have uh, very anomalous gold in soils around the contact of that intrusion. You know, these are plus 100, 200 PBB soil anomalies over several kilometres that have not been drilled. We can see this uh, evolving into a, a, you know, a serious mining camp that rivals, rivals many of the other very large world-class deposits in West Africa over the short term. We will be coming out with a Jork resource within this within six months of ownership. We expect to settle the actual acquisition within the next couple of weeks. We'll quickly move into pre-feasibility study, but we will not lose sight of growing this into a world-class gold deposit. Thank you, Chrissy. Well, well done. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Mr. Shemaine. Well, um, uh, and this uh, chocolate would have actually most likely come from Cote d'Ivoire as the world's largest ah, cocoa export. Possibly, that's <laughs> correct. That's it. I've actually, there's a chocolate factory down south and they do single origin chocolates. You know how you go to the different wineries, et cetera, and yeah, they do chocolates the same way. So if you're into chocolates, check them out. All right. Now, this could be an interesting conversation we're about to have. You've had a very interesting year. You've been up, you've been down. There's lots of we energy. Have. We're going to talk about TG, TG metals, aren't we? Um, it is one of the most energetic stories of the last 12 months. And this fellow is David Self. He is the CEO. Let us make him very welcome. Thank you, Chrissy, and uh, thanks to uh, Vertical Events for putting on such a great uh, conference every year that allows explorers to shine. I'm here to talk about uh, TG Metals and uh, Lake Johnson project, which is in an emerging um, high-grade lithium province. Uh, if you get one discovery, then it's just one discovery, but if you get more, then you're looking at a province. And I think that's what we've got here. There we go. Yeah, the green lights come on. Uh, usual disclaimer, and a bit more forward-looking statements. Okay, just a short uh, corporate overview. So uh, following our uh, $10 million capital raising in uh, December, um, we still have most of that in the, in the bank now, and, um, uh, but we only have a market cap now of 16 million. So our enterprise value is very low compared to our peers. And I think that's, uh, that's something we should be looking at with all investors going forward. Um, we've got more to discover and and uh, more great results it's coming coming soon, and um, and our enterprise value is just low compared to our peers. We have a great uh, board uh, that is supportive of our of our strategy. Uh, we and of course we've been delivering on that with our recent discoveries, but they're still continuing to support us in in our strategy going forward and and instrumental in getting our uh, ten million dollar capital raising away in in December. And that was the first capital raising we've had since IPO as well, which happened in May of uh, 2022. So just going on the, uh, where we are at, um, if, if for those of you who don't know where, where we are, I've probably never spoken to Jackson or Stewie, if that's the case. Uh, we, we're in um, the Lake Johnson Greenstone Belt. Um, surrounding us are, are four operating lithium mines. Um, the biggest of those is um, Earl Grey, which is still in the commissioning phase right now. Um, we're only 200 kilometres away from the um, Esperance port. Um, and we have the dominant land holding in the Lake Johnson Greenstone Belt. And uh, we're growing that with uh, some applications that we put forward as strategic um, early on before our uh, Burmeister discovery. And, um, and uh, they're getting granted. So we're getting more and more ground uh, to explore as well. 
uh, and, uh, and we were in there before some of the big movers came in behind us. Uh, we're making lithium discoveries. I mean, obviously, though, the first one of those was happened in uh, as early as October last year. Uh, but now we're learning from those, from that, and we're cracking on with uh, with our new areas. The whole region is uh, underexplored for lithium, and uh, we aim to to uh, increase that exploration data. Okay, so zooming in further on the. Uh, Lake Johnson project. So we've got 50 kilometre strike length of greenstone belt, and the whole lot of it is prospective for LCT pegmatites. Um, if most people have heard of the Goldilocks zone, well, the Goldilocks zone basically in early studies was covering all of our tenement, all of our tenure. Um, our significant Burmeister lithium discovery in October um, basically set the whole of uh, the uh, a, a, fr a frenzy of activity in the um, in the Lake Johnson area. Uh, Rio Tinto has recently come in, uh, joined venturing with uh, Charger on their ground and also uh, pegging some tenements as well. Um, and one of those is out near our uh, recent really granted Taylor Rocks um, uh, tenement. It's out to the, out to the east. Uh, we originally pegged that because uh, there is some greenstone raft in, a, in granite out there. Um, we don't know much about the, what's on the ground there at the moment. The tenement was only granted in the last few weeks. so. Uh, we'll be getting out there very shortly to see if there's any uh, outcropping pegmatite there, which is not what we've seen in uh, in Burmeister. Burmeister was completely undercover, no no outcrop to go off. Um, we've delivered uh, high grade lithium uh, results from our Burmeister discovery, basically from day one of our drilling on there. Uh, that was found through a soil anomaly. Uh, as I said, there was no there was no outcrop, uh, outcropping uh, pegmatite, so. Uh, we had a very short program in there and, and came up with a high grade discovery. And we also have our new uh, Jägermeister prospect, which is out to the uh, immediate east of uh, Burmeister. It's a large soil anomaly, uh, much larger in fact than, than Burmeister. And um, we'll be drill testing that uh, very shortly. We've got uh, a heritage survey uh, to be conducted starting next week up there, which will allow us to go and do our first drilling. We also have uh, further to the south, we've got a large tenement holding. Um, down there, which are 25 kilometres away from Burmeister, uh, which is the Tay Prospect. Um, that's almost been uh, devoid of uh, lithium exploration in, entirely in its, in its history of exploration. Uh, it's been a gold and uh, nickel prospect for uh, most of its life. Um, and we, uh, we've been doing some uh, uh, research on, a, on the historical drilling down there that was for gold and for nickel. And, um, and we believe some of it uh, may contain uh, pegmatites. In short, though, we're, we're located between two prolific uh, lithium bearing greenstone belts, and there's no reason why uh, uh, the Lake Johnson greenstone belt can't be the same. So, moving on with the, uh, our Burmeister discovery. So, it's just a picture there of our, one of our first holes uh, showing our, uh, the, the um, spodumene lighting up in the, in the drill chips. Um, and this is a, a drone shot looking south. Uh, Burmeister nickel laterite. So we started out li um, life as a, as a nickel exploration focused company. Um, we did define uh, some nickel laterite. Um, the market didn't particularly take well to that. So um, we moved on to nickel sulfide and then the tail end of that was our lithium drilling. And now we're a lithium focused company. So on a Burmeister discovery, um, there's just a short snapshot there of, of some of our, um, our better intercepts that we've got so far. Um, we've, what we're seeing is a stacked pegmatite system. Um, we've tested so far 1,400 metres uh, of strike length and is, is still open uh, to the north and, and to, the, to the south, to the west, um, to the east. We've got a lot more drilling to do there. Uh, we've got intercepts ranging uh, reported for, at the moment from 9 metres uh, thick to, to up to 19 metres. All of it's high grade, and um, there's, there's unusually for pegmatites, uh, there's mineralization throughout the entire widths of the pegmatites. We don't have um, any internal waste, uh, at least none that we have drilled so far. Uh, we're getting through at the moment with approvals to set ourselves up for a future resource drill out on, uh, on Burmeister. So uh, we've currently got a 200 meter spacing by 100 meter. Uh, we want to close that up. 
to uh, 100 by 100 and then even closer um, and testing uh, and concentrating on our, our up dip, um, shallow intercepts. Um, we're confident that we'll get high grade all the way through. Um, that should lead us towards a, a resource sometime um, later on in the year or, or early next year. Uh, as I said, we do have a lot of drilling to do. So this one, uh, Burmeister Pegmatite. So this is one of our thicker intercepts. Um, it's a shallow uh, weathering profile, but that's has knocked out all of the, uh, the uh, outcrop that's, that's available. Uh, flat dipping, it's gonna be favorable for mining in the future. Um, seeing the Pegmatite thickening towards the north, and that's certainly something we're concentrating on with our new um, phase, phases of drilling. And, um, and as, I, as I said, spodumene occurs throughout the pegmatites and it's all high grade. Done a bit of work on the mineralogy and uh, we found that spodumene is not only the dominant uh, lithium mineral, but it's the dominant mineral in the pegmatite. Um, so uh, it's basically uh, spodumene, quartz and feldspar. Um, the simple mineralogy, we're hoping, it will, will uh, translate into simple low cost metallurgy. Um, and we're gonna start some metallurgical test work uh, soon once we get the assays back for our recent core drilling. On the Jägermeister Prospect, um, as I said, large lithium uh, in soil anomaly, 100 ppm. It's five kilometres long. It's open in the north and south. Uh, we've done some infill just recently, waiting for assays back on that. We're going to put our first drill holes in that in, in March. And approvals are well advanced. And emerging prospects, Taylor Rocks, as I mentioned before, uh, the Tay Prospect as well, and other strategic applications that we've had to the north. And just going on in key investment drives, we've got a strong balance sheet, $10 million. We can do whatever, all, all of what we're planning to do. We've got a great team of geologists and, um, and management, and we've got, uh, <laughs> we're going to execute our plans in 2024. Thank you all. Yes, I know. Yes or no? Yeah, buddy speak. Hold on there. You take it then. There we go. <laughs> well done. Congratulations. Good speak, but you know, you missed out by two seconds. No all right. Uh, things are happening all over the place as we speak at this conference. And there was some news out of Queensland. I'll read it out to you. Two prime movers and shakers in northwest Queensland copper gold exploration, Hammer Metals and Carnaby Resources are in merger talks. Hammer broke the news on the ASX this morning, cautioning the discussions are at a relatively early stage. There is no certainty that a transaction between the companies will eventuate. Daniel Thomas, if you can, enlighten us, or at least tell us why, and I like the first statement, prime mover and shaker in the gold and copper world. Over to you. Will you please make Daniel very welcome, everyone? Thanks, Chrissy. You're certainly on the pulse there. I was kind of hoping I could get through 10 minutes and not mention the obvious, but. Uh, as you said, very early stage discussions and uh, nothing is certain out of them. Um, I'll focus on the Mount Isa region and the opportunities that are presented there. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the opportunities in Mount Isa are immense and I th think our cover side here is rather, rather fitting. It is a picture of sunrise at Kelman uh, and I think it really is sunrise of the Mount Isa region as we head into a world of uh, copper shortage and good copper investment opportunities and I'd like to talk to you about what I think is one of the better ones at the moment. I'll let you read the, the statement at your leisure. In terms of the company, you know, you can read all of these points. There are three ways that we're going to deliver returns for our shareholders and each of them I think has a, has a great chance of providing the returns investors are looking for. Number one, our existing resource base, some 530,000 tonnes of copper equivalent metal in a resource already. I think we're incredibly undervalued from the perspective of copper dollars per pound of copper in our resource base relative to our peers. That's opportunity number one. Opportunity number two is investing in a company that has a great path to exploration success. So you've got to have the right team and the right projects. And we've amassed some 3,000 square kilometres of tenure in the Mount Isa region. And we have a team that's responsible for world-class mineral discoveries uh, historically and have made recent mineral discoveries in the Mount Isa region. So in terms of exploration success, there's another opportunity for value. And the third, have a look, um, I guess, at the, the recent history in the Mount Isa region uh, of potential consolidation opportunities. And obviously the one that Chrissy alluded to there um, presents one of those opportunities in the region in Mount Isa in the last 18 months, we've seen seven transactions with a minimum deal size of $30 million. 
This is a region that's moving forward with great opportunity. If you're looking for copper opportunities, I would look no further than our own backyard in Mount Isa. In terms of the company current position, market capitalization of $43 million. Our cash position there of $1.8 million doesn't include the R&D tax refund that we expect uh, early next month. Last year, that was $1.1 million. And we also have some funds that are due for some JV drilling that we did in December. You can see we're in a very similar position at this conference last year in terms of our, our share price. Um, we experienced an incredible run through April and May on the back of some really good news. And I'll talk to you about our 12 months. I think it's been an exceptional 12 months I don't think anyone here um, would argue with this overall sentiment in the sector for the last 12 months, but I present to you what we have achieved during that 12 month period. We increased our jork resource at Kelman by 40%. So we now have over 40 million tonnes there, 39.9 million tonnes at 1.1% copper equivalent. We found three new deposits in the Mount Isa region, each of them delivering 50 metre intersections of greater than 1% copper. It's pretty rare to find one of these, let alone three in a year. So I'll talk a little bit about them and our plans for 2024. In terms of Mount Isa and where we are, we're located midway between Mount Isa and Cloncurry, tier one deposits in every which direction. We're exploring two large fault structures there that we think are highly prospective and underexplored. The number of these systems that we've been um, unearthing these, these drill hits on have never been drilled previously. And there's many, many more of them, particularly within our tenure and our uh, surrounding tenure. In terms of the overall region and you know the discussions that Chrissy alluded to, our portfolio with that 530,000 tonnes of copper, uh, neighbours next to us have circa 300,000 tonnes of copper equivalent metal. You're building the base load of mineralisation that can support mines for 10 to 20 plus years at you know uh, production volumes that are significant. Um, this is the opportunity that exists in this region with additional exploration uh, and obviously additional success. In terms of Kelman, if you've heard me speak here before, you've, sp you've heard me talk about this asset last year, um, this increase, 39 million tonnes, to copper, gold, molybdenum, rhenium deposit. The open pit material now uh, encompasses 71% of the mineral resource. That 27.7 million tonnes in a copper equivalent recovered grade at 0.9% is very similar in size, grade, strip ratio, as a T3 project was in Botswana when it was acquired by Samphire Resources. I know those numbers particularly well because I worked for Samphire when they acquired that project. Sure, it certainly was discovered, uh, it, sorry, it was taken through a feasibility study at the, at, the, at the time of the purchase, and Kelman is still pre-scoping study, but this size of deposit, the grades, the strip ratio lend to the economics, and being located in a tier one mining jurisdiction with established infrastructure has some advantages. It's funny, people, people say to me, look, you're struggling for traction with your, your copper molybdenum project. Why don't you think about a uranium project? Not many people appreciate the price of molybdenum and what molybdenum has done over the past three and a half years. There has been a significant price increase in molybdenum. You can see the blue line there showing the price of moly relative to uranium. Uh, molybdenum is going to be a new age mineral. It's going to be used in stainless steel in all the applications that we see for turbines, be it wind, nuclear, gas. It'll have a source in electric vehicles and for the support panels of solar panels. It is going to be required moving forward and the overall thematics around supply and demand are very similar to copper. In fact, most molybdenum is mined from copper deposits, from the porphyry deposits of South America. So we see a very strong future for molybdenum. Um, the Kalman project represents probably uh, a top five project in terms of grade for an undeveloped project in the world. Uh, molybdenum has just been added to Australia's critical minerals list. So I think a project such as this um, would attract some attention from the government agencies when they look to opportunities within Australia for the development of this critical mineral. Our priorities this year are to follow up on last year's hits at Hardway, uh, the South Hope region. Um, we have world-class uh, joint venture partners in Sumitomo Metal Mining uh, and Glencore. We're looking to advance our activities there in, as well as looking for our own large-scale IOCG systems. We believe this region's capable of delivering more tier one copper gold deposits, and that is our attention from an exploration perspective, whilst also pursuing those exceptional drill hits that we had from last year. In terms of Hardway, Hardway is a kilometre long strike. We've now drilled 20 holes at this particular prospect. We're looking at anywhere from 15 to 30 metres wide, up to 50 metres wide in parts at grades between 0.7 and 1% copper. 
There's some really interesting rare earth grades here, but it isn't a focus for us. We are focused on the copper potential. But I think where we see large IOCG systems, we also see an abundance of rare earth mineralisation, some interesting grades of cobalt and manganese, and Hardway has all of these all of these aspects to them. We're drilling a couple of deeper holes here, looking for a sulphide uh, source at depth, and I think this will be one of the early stage targets for this year. You can see the extent of surface uh, copper anomalism there, it's quite substantive over a, a large period. In terms of other targets, Bull Rush, Bull Rush is another target we'll be testing in 2024, large scale IOCG system out in the granite unit there. Again, cutting edge frontier exploration for these large systems with no exploration or no drilling in these areas historically. In terms of uh, our project down at South Hope, you can see it sits very complementary to the Carnaby Resources, Mount Hope prospects there where a mineral resource was established late last year. Again, the exploration potential in and around that boundary is strong and presents great opportunity for, for, for us moving forward. Last but not least, and I, I, I talked about this in a cricket term, this is really a free hit for us. This is our secondary project here in WA, and whilst we may be a little bit late on the lithium perspective, we have a great target sitting on the opposite side of uh, the Liontown deposit at Kathleen Valley. In terms of the particular project here, we're just about to start drilling. In fact, Clay from Strike told me that the drill rig's turning up tonight, so I expect the drill rig's to be turning by the end of the week, uh, and we'll be testing underneath some pegmatites and lithium geochemistry anomalism that looks super exciting on the edge of the granite. Uh, not only that, will we be drilling uh, the lithium potential here in the exact same positions, albeit on a slightly different orientation, we have gold mineralisation here. So you've seen many deposits through Western Australia where we've seen gold and lithium mineralisation together. Some of the historical hits we've had here at eight metres at four, four metres at six, offer some great upside potential. I'll point your attention to hole 28, which is located roughly halfway down there. There's some 200 metres of spacing in between that to the line to the north. Uh, that particular hole, four metres at six grams per tonne, we'll follow that up with that drilling. Very busy program coming up here at Mount Isa, drilling with our JV partner, lots of news flow to look forward to. And of course, we'll see where those discussions get to. Thanks very much. Well done. That's a good treat for the end of a big day. Well done. Great presentation. Thank you so much. All right, team, we're going to Quebec, uh, over to Canada for our next presentation. So an interesting opportunity for you. Cygnus Metals, they're actually the fourth ASX listed company to produce a drought compliant resource in that jam-packed little region. This fellow here is David Southam. He's the managing director and he is going to enlighten us as to what's happening over there. Would you please make him welcome? Uh, thank you, Chrissy. Um, in the spirit of uh, Valentine's Day, I'm going to um, seek forgiveness rather than permission um, and, and pinch uh, an extra minute. And the reasons will be um, a, a, a very grand. And it's a little bit sombre, but it's also a bit of a reminder um, of why we're here uh, and, what, and what we do. Because we've heard a lot about um, ground and especially people over the last two days. This is really a shout out to, to RIU and for those who would have seen the uh, Craig Oliver Award and you know everyone I'm sure knows the story uh, behind that, that on the 19th of uh, June 2010, uh, the Sundance uh, plane went down. Um, I actually lost my chairman uh, uh, in, that, in that plane crash and lost um, a few friends. And so I had the privilege of, of help, trying to help out Sundance uh, post that plane crash. So it's really a shout out to RIU to continue that. They haven't forgotten people in the Oliver family and also encourage um, uh, continue their sponsorship uh, and also IGO um, who did take over Western areas who um, really did push um, that Craig Oliver award. So um, just a little, a little gentle reminder there. So have I got my minute back? Okay, very good. So look, I'm not gonna go over um, lithium price. We've heard about that. We know what it's done uh, to equities, um, but we know that we've seen this before. And I've heard it mentioned a few times today, the Mount Holland deposit, um, where I was lucky enough to be a director of uh, Kidman Resources, where we sold that uh, to West Farmers. And that was really at the, at the top of the market. And, and then we saw a nuclear winter in lithium uh, for a number of years. I think the supply and demand dynamic is completely different to then. 
Um, and I think you should, this, if there's ever a time to be looking at lithium stocks, and I'm not talking my own bulk here, I'm talking about a lot of lithium stocks and especially in Quebec, um, now is a time uh, to look into it. Um, the image you see there is, um, is quite relevant to some of the promises uh, that we made last year. And so really what I want to do is, is focus on the strategy. And of course, um, you should always do um, your own school report when you're coming back a year later. And when you do your own school report, you tend to get A's for everything you do. So excuse that. Um, but we did promise that we would come out with a maiden resource, which we did of 10 million tonnes, only on uh, 11,000 metres of drilling at a minute uh, uh, drilling cost uh, per tonne of lithium found. And so there's still more work uh, to be done there um, because we've only really been there a year. We've grown the team. We have a chairman now in country. We have in-country managers, and we're currently drilling there um, with our team uh, as we speak. We also acquired a number of projects. Uh, we are now the largest ASX-listed landholder uh, in James Bay. Now, large doesn't necessarily mean better, um, but what I will do is, is show you why that's important uh, for us. We've also made multiple discoveries, and this is a little bit of a bugbear um, of mine in the lithium space, because it has been very active in James Bay. Um, we've been there for 18 months, and there's been uh, a number, there's been a rush of companies grabbing uh, ground uh, in, in James Bay and Ontario and other places within Canada. And so when we make announcements, uh, we make announcements about spodumene in pegmatites. Whilst announcing a pegmatite is interesting, 99.5% um, of pegmatites aren't mineralized. And so whilst it can be a pointer, you should always look out for spodumene bearing pegmatites. Otherwise, uh, Cygnus will be releasing an announcement every day for the next 365 days. And the last thing you want to hear is a Kiwi banging on about pegmatites. And finally, um, you know, we have invested, we have, sorry, and on those acquisitions, we have made some discoveries. We've hit some intersections of, of some very high grade lithium. We've found a couple of outcrops that are high grade lithium bearing, which we are drilling at the moment. And we've completed around 18,000 metres of drilling. And that's a shout out to my team. My team go out there uh, and minus 35 degrees uh, uh, to uh, manage the drill program in Quebec. In summer, you can basically uh, be flown away by the flies. So it is interesting conditions, but winter is actually the best time to drill. So where we're located, as I said, we are the largest on the ASX in terms of land holding around three projects, uh, Pontax, um, Eau Claire and Sakami. What's important, we're right next to infrastructure, we're right next to uh, roads, uh, um, hydropower, and we're also near also large deposits. And these large companies such as Acadium, which is the merger of Alltech, uh, Allchem and Livent, they don't have exploration portfolios within, um, within Quebec. None of the large players do. And it's something which is missing uh, in, their, in all of their portfolios. And we happen to be next to Arcadian's uh, two projects, which is James Bay, which is the largest uh, lithium uh, resource in James Bay. It beat uh, Corvette by 1 million tonnes a couple of days later after Corvette came out with theirs. So I'm sure a geologist had a little bit of fun there. Uh, and also next to the Namaska lithium project, which they own 50% uh, of. And we also have ground at Sakami, which, I'll, which I will talk about. So Pontax, um, you can see the greenstone belt that we're on. We only focus on greenstone belts. Um, it is 30 k's as the crow flies to the largest uh, deposit in, in James Bay. We've defined a resource. We've got 44 kilometres of strike and we've really only tested a couple. Um, so there's more, um, more, definitely more to be found there. But bear in mind, we've only been there one year drilling and we already have a resource. The second, which is probably um, gaining a little bit of attention from some of our shareholders and prospective shareholders and strategics is our land holding at All Clare. Um, this has never been looked at for lithium. And in the months that we've been there, we found a, a significant outcrop um, undercover, um, which the geologists found through about a 20 centimetre gap uh, and was sitting undercover. You would have never known you're walking on top of it. 
We've had drill intersections where we've followed it, but we've, what we've done is the hard scientific work. We've done things um, such as sampling all the pegmatites that are in the region to measure fractionation. Um, we've flown LIDAR. We're, at, we're waiting on results um, from um, soil, from toil samples. So you can just, sorry, teal samples. Um, so you can, you can see that we've done the hard work. It's not necessarily sexy, but it's how you then um, able to pinpoint when you've got 400 square kilometers of where you want to explore. And with two days left in our season, um, we are able to discover the Pegasus outcrop, which you can see here is quite significant. And you look at those uh, grab sample uh, grades there, um, they are significant. We only got two days in there. And we know from the fractionation results, that's where we should be looking. Um, we've got a drill rig uh, working there at the moment, and so there will be um, news flow, but you can see the size. You're looking at over 100 metres of strike on an outcrop. And so we will see uh, what Mother Earth um, provides us, if I'm allowed to say Mother. Sakami, um, that is on the same greenstone belt as Patriot. So you do get a lot of uh, neurology in this region. I think um, there's a, another Patriot company and there's a Corvette South and Corvette North, East and West um, that aren't on the same greenstone belt. Um, we are, we're at 44 kilometres away. Uh, you might have heard that last year in Quebec, there were significant fires. And uh, so that stopped us getting out. Um, to be able uh, to do all the prospecting that we would like. And then the, the snow came in early. So we have done completed some prospecting there. Um, yeah. There are multiple pegmatites, but as I said, having pegmatites, that's only uh, a, a small piece of the puzzle. It's whether it's spodumene bearing. And so we're doing that fractionation results and, and in summer, we will get out there again. And then finally, we've heard a little bit about rare earths. And this is something in Western Australia, um, which I think is flying completely beneath the radar. If you have a look at some of our intersections here, which are basically right near surface, and you can see the section at the bottom of the image there, you know, we're hitting 79 metres at over uh, 1600 ppm, which includes eight metres at over 7,000. Also, intersections are 25 metres at 2745. I have one minute 19 to go. Uh, just I can see you in the corner of my eye in your red outfit. So, and so you know we now have got 22 kilometres of strike. Now I am not allowed as a as a um, as a CEO to talk about well what does that mean in terms of scale. But not being a geologist and and, and getting into trouble with the jork police who put people in jail, um, you you could you can do the maths yourself, which would result in hundreds of millions of tons. What's really important for us now is we're doing the MET work. Um, you would have seen a chap floating around here today um, with a big ANSTO brand. It's the same metallurgical test work uh, that Meteoric have done. We will see what that test work tells us. We know that this ground has never been looked at for ionic clays. This is sitting like four metres from surface. It's a free dig. Um, and our EV at the moment is sitting around $15 million. And what you get for that is a 10 million ton lithium resource, lithium intersections, and a major potential rare earth discovery. And on that note, I will say thank you. <laughs> that was very impressive. Thank you very much. And the boys, you deserve that. It's a good, a good tribute to them. Well done to you, sir. All right. Now, last year at this time, uh, Dynamic was a newly minted little company. They were less than three weeks old. Their members were wandering around outside in the masses and amongst the 1500 delegates. This year, they have got a booth, they've got peoples, they've got passion, they've got excitement, and they've got a story to tell us. So this is Karen Wellman. She is their, are you the head geologist? The managing director. The managing director and everything. This is, <laughs> this is the person in charge that is making it all happen. So please make her welcome as she shares the dynamic story with us. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, right, so thank you all for staying. I've got a bit of a treat for you guys today. So um, if you want to take out your phones and scan that QR code down there, you'll get a subscription to uh, our newsletter and get update, updated with our um, exploration activities this year. So if you want to do that for me, that'd be great. As uh, Chrissy said, Dynamic has been around for a year now. So we're, we're pretty new on the, on the um, 
in the market, but you know, we've sort of been growing and developing over the last year, and so I'm, ha I'm very excited to present the story for you. So investment highlights, why invest in dynamic? I mean, we have a portfolio, an exceptional portfolio of uh, critical minerals projects uh, located here in West Australia. Where else would you want to be? Um, we've exposed to multiple commodities. So we've got lithium, gold, um, copper, nickel, PGEs um, that we're looking for. The team has been working together for several years. We were spun out of a company called Jindalee Resources. Uh, so we've been working this up for quite a long time. So we're quite heavily invested personally um, uh, in uh, seeing the successful results that we've got. We hit the ground running last year, like we said we would. We drilled over 11,000 metres. Um, and we had some quite good results um, during that, which we'll touch on. Um, and most of all, importantly, the, the company we believe is, is quite, you're leveraged to success with dynamic metals, as I'll go into here. We've only got 49 million shares on issue. Uh, our share price, as of yesterday, was sitting about 17 cents. We listed at 20 cents last year. Uh, gives us a market cap of about 8.6 million. Uh, we've got 3.1 million left in the bank at the moment, so our EV is sitting at about 5.5 million. Um, so you can start to see what I'm talking about as, as leverage success. One of the key points, if you're looking at the uh, share price chart, as I said, we started at 20, we're sitting here. We've maintained sort of momentum throughout the course of a year, which has been quite challenging um, in capital markets. And I think one of the reasons for this success is that we have a very supportive um, group of um, investors. The share registry is fairly tight. You'll see in the top 20 there, the ownership has gone from 50% to about 65% um, because they believe in the story, they believe in the management, and they believe in our projects. So I think that speaks volumes for itself. So I'll just, uh, this is a, a map of our projects here in Western Australia. As I said, we've got quite a large portfolio in some very good uh, regions of Western Australia. I won't, I'll just touch on the, the two uh, ones which we're going to directly work on in the immediate future, um, uh, which are the Widgimulsa project and the Deepwell project. But you can see there in the map, um, these lighter coloured dots around, this is what we refer to as our generative portfolio, um, as well as the Lindsay's and Leinster projects, they're all part of our generative and there'll be a lot more news for coming out on those as, as we go through the year. So the Widgimulsa project is a bit of an overview. Uh, so Widgimulsa is located about an hour south of Kalgoorlie. Uh, we hold a large land position uh, in Kalgoorlie. It's easily accessible. We've got roads and highways running through the project. Um, it's a perspective for gold, lithium, nickel. Um, we've been, we've, we have 100% of the mineral rights, which is very important too. Uh, we've not sold anything as we go along, so we have the rights to explore um, everything at this point in time. Um, and from this area, there's been a lot of historic activity. So particularly on the gold and nickel side of things, we had a lot of data to go with. So we were able to generate those drill-ready targets. On the lithium, lithium side of things, as I talk about that, uh, the lithium story at Widgimulta is a lot more early stage. So it's really started emerging as a, a rich belt. Um, and you'll see here from the map that our tenements, so that darker blue and orange color, that's uh, Dynamics Holdings at Widgimulta. Um, just for a bit of reference, the lighter colored material is the Cali Metals um, Holdings, um, which people are probably quite familiar with from their recent listing and quite, they've been quite successful post listing. So you can see we're in the right neighborhood to, to make a discovery. Um, other discoveries, we've got Widgie Nickel discovered the, the Faraday spodumene deposit that sits uh, just up in here too. So you can see like we've got a lot going on um, in some pretty good areas. Uh, Develop Group um, took over Essential Metals, which covers the background here. We've got the western side of the Pioneer Dome. So last year, our goal with the lithium exploration, as I said, it's very early stage. There's no drill data and things to go with, um, so we've had to start from the beginning. So our first pass has been to do systematic soil sampling um, across our, our portfolio. Um, so, and from that, we've had quite a few highlights. Down at the Pioneer Dome, we identified a 2.8 kilometer anomaly uh, to follow up on. We did some further auger work there. Um, up here at uh, Frank's far southeast, uh, we identified uh, two more soil anomalies over 100 uh, ppm lithium oxide. Um, they're both greater than a kilometer in strike. So we need to get back out there for some follow up. And then up here at Spargo's East, it's probably uh, one of the most interesting ones we've had so far, up to 409 ppm lithium, in our, uh, lithium oxide in our soils. Uh, and that area, we know that there's um, 
spodumene bearing pegmatites, very important, David, um, in the area. So we're very much in the right neighbourhood and we look forward to advancing that further. And that's a map of the Spargos East area. So you can see how that's lighting up in that, in that northern part there. Um, so those drill lines are about 400 metres apart. So we'll go back and do some uh, further refine uh, the area for targeting um, and located quite close to the Mount Marion operations, as you can see there. Uh, touching on the gold at Widgie Mortha, so gold prospectors have been exploring here since 1890s. Uh, our tenements sit uh, close to uh, St Ives Gold Camp. You've got Mandilla Project with Austra Astral uh, and the Higginsville Camp. Um, so there's been multiple um, million ounce deposits of gold in the area. We did a little bit of gold exploration last year. I can see all these orange coloured dots uh, labels up here are all of our gold targets to be followed up on. We drilled at Higginsville last year, at just the first pass air core program and got a metre at 5.6 at the bottom of hole. And at Mandilla, we got a metre at 3.1 in the bottom of hole. Both of those are yet to be followed up um, and we'll be getting onto them quite early this year. The second project that I want to talk about is the Deep Well project. So Deep Well um, is perspective for nickel, copper and PGDs. And why this one's quite exciting is that there's six kilometres of, of these outcropping gossons at surface. And so far, there hasn't been any drilling underneath those gossons. So we've been, uh, we're have been working with the, the, the Native, Native Tidal Group, um, and we'll be doing a heritage uh, survey in the next month or two, um, and we look forward to doing our first pass exploration project out there. But this is the one that really gets my attention because you know we, we don't know what we're, we're going to find in the ground there, so we're quite, um, quite excited as a geologist to see what lies beneath the surface. And this gives you a bit of an idea of what the exploration program looks like over the next 12 months. As I mentioned, we've got uh, 3 million left in the bank, which keeps us going in terms of the infill soil sampling work that we're going to do both at around Widgie Mortha at Spargos and Frank's Find, as well as uh, working on our Lake Percy project. We'll also get stuck into some drilling um, at Higginsville, Mandilla, um, and then moving on to, towards Deepwell uh, and a few more of those other areas around Ridgey Mortha. Um, you can see the program is very much uh, targeted towards lithium and gold exploration, plus the nickel copper PGEs up at Lake Percy. So why invest in dynamic? Um, you know, I believe our portfolio is quite exceptional. People never quite understand the size uh, of the Widgie Mortha project in particular because of its great location. As I mentioned, we've got a quality team. The team has a, a track record of, of delivering and being successful, and, and people follow that. Um, and that's why we've got such a strong shareholder registry. Uh, we've got a very active program in front of us. Our motto right now, even with the market uncertainty, is just keep calm and carry on. Uh, you know, the proof is in the pudding, and we'll get that when, when we keep going with our exploration work. And as I mentioned, it's an attractive um, valuation, uh, a highly leveraged to success with the, the tight share registry. Um, we are in the right place and the right location and the right time, and we've got the cash to, uh, to, to get some results. So as I said, we're in the right position to, to discover with Dynamic. Come see us at booth 10 if you would like some more uh, information and talk through the projects in a bit more detail. Thank you. Well done, Karen Wellman. Well done. One chocolate view. That was absolutely fantastic. Maiden, uh, maiden exposure there on the. On the... Geez, that doesn't sound right, does it? Let's just, that was a great first first show. Well done. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. I hope you get a lot of people out there at Booth Ten. All right, Kaz Deluca. Right, we're saving some of the best for last two days. So lucky we have a nice discerning audience here in the room. So Kaz's passion is exploration. She's a geologist with a number of years of experience. She is leading Novo. And what she's doing in 2024, I believe, is taking them back out into the field. She's heading for that next big gold discovery. So Kaz, let us know where you're looking. Where are you looking, where you're going to find it? Would you please make Kaz very welcome, everyone? Thanks, Chrissy. So uh, yeah, I agree with Karen. Thanks very much for hanging on to the bitter end today. And uh, I've got a really interesting story to talk to you about, so I'm glad you did. Um, we are going to talk mostly today about our projects in the Pilbara. We've got a large land holding there. And you can see here the landscape in the banner is pretty much what we're used to on a day-to-day -day basis. We do have some projects uh, in Victoria, which uh, get a mention today, but there's a conference next 
week in uh, Melbourne, where a lot more detail, Chris will go into a lot more detail on the Victorian projects if you're interested. Um, one of the things I would like to say is that, you know, 10 minutes you can't actually get much across. I've simplified a lot of the aspects of the geology and the projects down for you, but please visit our website. And uh, if you want to spend more time on the cautionary statement, it's there for your enjoyment as well. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to tell you that Novo actually operate across nine different uh, traditional owner groups in the Pilbara, uh, and one also in, in Victoria, the Jajawarang. Um, we have really good relationships uh, with most of these groups, and we'd like to pay our respects to all members of the Indigenous communities we work with, and to elders past, present and emerging. Okay, um, I kind of did the summary first, just in case I got shooed off the, uh, the podium from, from Chrissy. Um, we had a pretty turbulent year last year. Um, we did some deals. Uh, they all culminated pretty much in the week before Christmas, so that was pretty interesting. Um, but we are, we're really starting the year now with a great story from my perspective, and hopefully you'll understand. Um, we have a clear target. We are looking for gold. We want to deliver plus million ounce development potential resources. That's our focus. We um, we have a, a strong group that are actually working, and we've, we're, we've all really been with Novo for five years, so everyone is very clued up on the uh, the geology in the in the Pilbara projects. Uh, we've still got seven thousand five hundred square k's of Pilbara exploration um, tenure that we're working on, um, and we've managed to do various deals to uh, farm out things like our lithium projects to major groups like uh, SQM and Leotam, which has is, 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 uh, um, injected nearly $12 million into our, uh, our pockets in the last year, and also a great joint venture deal on the edge a joint venture with DeGray Mining on a thousand square kilometres of ground just south of Hemi and the Hemi resource. Um, I hope you all saw Phil's uh, presentation yesterday because he talked to the edge a camp quite a bit, and uh, you know, you'll see that when you, when you look at the maps, uh, we've got very similar geology and, and high prospectivity all throughout our, uh, our edge in a joint venture. <clears throat> Lastly, we are, <laughs> I, it sounds like uh, Groundhog Day, but we are really well funded. Uh, we've got 20 mil, 21 million in cash in the bank as of the end of January, and uh, we've got $30 million in investments that we can call on as the year goes by. This is just really a notice to show you uh, the land holding. Um, you can see up here in the pinks and purples that there are our lithium joint ventures. They're all managed by uh, our joint venture partners. What I'm going to focus on is the edge in a gold camp, this area through here. In the north is the edge in a joint venture, and in the south is a joint venture with Mark Creasy and the Creasy Group. And also uh, Nanyuri North is our first prospect that we've really focused on in that southern belt. Uh, just quickly, this is really just the take home message is no debt. Um, we've got great investment portfolio there. Uh, our shareholding has improved demonstrably in the last year. And uh, I guess, as I say, cash in the bank of 21 million to spend on exploration. Um, honing straight into the Edgina Gold Camp, um, we did a great deal with De Grey. They, they are going to invest up to $25 million on exploration at Besha uh, and the surrounding tenure. Uh, this, these sort of, oh, backwards. Can I go backwards? Yes. Um, these areas through here will be consolidated during the year, I'm sure, uh, giving them that northern portion of the ground adjacent to all of their uh, hemi project area. Um, they now have a significant uh, area in the uh, Malina Basin, which is the host for all the HEMI and uh, similar deposits, structural deposits as well, like Withnal. Uh, and, you know, the corridor is really significant. It runs east-west for sure, but it also runs down here through the edge of the gold camp. And you can see we've got various prospects that we're going to be working on during the year. <clears throat> um, there's over 10,500 um, 
metres of various drilling, mostly Air Course um, RC, Scout RC, that degraded across last, the, the last quarter of 2000 and, uh, 2023. Um, and they've got a larger program that they're going to continue with this year. Just briefly, um, the results that we have so far from the RC drilling, um, we've hit a really interesting uh, new style of mineralisation here on the Heckmeyer intrusion. Um, just explaining this map a little bit, anything that has a cross on it is intrusive, whether it be um, diorite, sinucatoid or ultramafic. Um, we come across a, a main uh, anomaly in here from the air core that only two scat holes have been put into. And we've got a really significant, kind of unexplained at the moment, but base metals, silver up to, you know, 60 grams, a sniff of gold in there as well, but really significant numbers that both ourselves and DeGray are, are keen to track across this kilometre trend. And, you know, both holes sit, sit underneath each other and those results look pretty significant to me. Um, uh, in addition, there's numbers from the first drilling at low, which are shown here. So again, just two holes, oh, sorry, four holes, uh, quite shallow, and the best trend, the best uh, results are eight metres at nearly five grams. So again, quite successful for just two, two deeper RC scout holes. <clears throat> Moving to the south, which is basically our, our, the ground that we manage, um, you see that Nunyari North, right in the south here, is our main prospect. This is, a, this is a greenstone belt, this is 60 kilometres of fertile structural trend right across the belt with Hemi in the north and Nunyari in the south. And this is one of the main areas where our, our focus will be during the year. Um, we've done a lot of work now to understand uh, the geometries and the geology at Nunyari North. And I just want the takeaway home message here is our proof of concept, if you like. Uh, dr drilling was done just in this very small portion and we've got a lot more work on various targets, whether they be structural, intrusive or um, or, you know, actually chasing the type stratigraphy that we know is the target horizon. Uh, we did put an announcement out about this yesterday. Uh, just a mention of Victoria, and unfortunately I'm not going to talk to you much about it now because I'm running out of time already. So, two, two slides to go. <clears throat> this is how we're going to work this year. Um, obviously, De Grey will be looking after one or two rigs at any point in time this year once the, uh, the season becomes a bit more amenable. So we'll have a drill rig heading out doing more scout RC and follow up. Um, we are going to follow up the maiden RC drilling that we did down at Nunyari North, where we've got pretty interesting significant results given that there's no drilling ever been done in a, a, a radius of about 50 kilometres of Nunyari North. Um, so we're working on that already and we'll probably do some diamond drilling as well to try and really suss out the structural complexity there. Uh, we've also got a project at Balabala, which has stalled a little bit because we're just waiting on um, permit approvals, but we're expecting that as well before the, the middle of the year. Um, and then Belltopper with diamond drilling at the moment, and you'll hear more about that going through. Now, this is it, so the last slide. Um, we think we are heading towards success. We think we've got all the ingredients that we need to, uh, to define a standalone gold project. We've got plenty of targets on our own tenure. Um, we've got a great team, a great portfolio, good joint ventures, and um, what else? Oh, and we're going to be doing project generation as well. So uh, that's it. Happy days. Yes. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Ten minutes goes so quickly. <laughs> oh, don't tell anyone else I gave you. Thanks so much, Thank Karis. All right, now our last discussion today. This is a really interesting one. I don't know, do you know much about S and P Global Intelligence and what they do? I had a really interesting chat with the guys out there at the booth, I think time before last. You guys measure everything from beauticians to automotive to stars to, and in this case today, you are measuring global mineral exploration trends. There you go. So of all the things in the world, obviously related to a resources conference, that's what we're doing today. So this is Jared Smith, everyone. He is the head of commodity sales here in Australia. Please make him very welcome and listen with interest. Thanks, Jarrah. Thanks very much. Thanks for hanging around for the last presentation today. Um, 
Thank you to Vertical Events for once again putting on such a vibrant conference. Um, over the past 10 odd years of attending this event, I've always found it to be a great indicator of the year ahead. Today's presentation will provide the audience with an update of global exploration trends and, and key indicators for the year ahead. S&P Global recently released our Global Exploration Budget Report for 2023, which incorporates interviews with over 3,000 mining and exploration companies. Key findings indicate that macroeconomic headwinds and geopolitical tensions have had a significant impact on exploration activity globally. While metal prices are elevated compared to pre-pandemic levels, most have fallen considerably from their 2022 highs, with the global aggregate exploration budget falling slightly by 3% year over year from 2022. For 2024, we forecast exploration budgets to remain at current levels. However, should the macro environment and financing conditions remain as is, we believe that a modest year over year decline of around about 5% is the most likely scenario. Gold budgets, which typically, typically account for around about half of the global exploration budget, slipped by 16% in 2023. This was enough to cancel out all the gains registered by base and battery metals. Looking forward, we see gold exploration bouncing back with the prospect of lower US inflation rates, uh, in interest rates, sorry, uh, weaker dollar and, and ongoing geopolitical tensions continuing to drive the gold price and demand based on strong central bank buying and retail sales. While overall budgets declined in 2023, exploration for battery metals across copper, lithium, nickel, cobalt and zinc primarily continued their upward trend to an all-time high of US $1.6 billion, which was a 40% increase from 2022. This is despite significant price pressures in the lithium sector due to weakening demand. Declining consumer affordability has triggered some automakers to scale back electric vehicle production plans, which is likely to prolong the weakness in lithium prices and trigger further supply discipline from the mining sector. Looking at the copper market, it also features short-term supply demand balance challenges. However, since December, we have seen a significant adjustment with a market surplus reducing, and we now expect copper smelters to feature a supply shortage of concentrate starting in 2024. Exploration budgets for lithium increased in 2023 by 77% to an all-time high of 830 US million, displacing nickel as the top battery metal in 2023 and making it the third most explored commodity overall. The lithium story is largely shaped by junior explorers, allocating more to mostly early and late stage assets. While nickel exploration is heavily influenced by major companies increasing activity at brownfield existing mine locations, Canada and Australia continue to be the top exploration hubs for these battery metals, which can be attributed to geology, discoveries driving interest, and the concentration of junior explorers on the TSXV, ASX, and also incentives to spend raised funds locally. Copper budgets increased 12% in 2023 to their highest level since 2013. Due to its role in decarbonisation and electrification, copper exploration is expected to be strong in the near term, as evident by an uptick in capital raisings by juniors in the second half of 2023. This is despite an environment with tight monetary conditions. When we look at 
Global project drilling, the December slowdown trend of the past two years continued in 2023, finishing on a low note, the total drill holes reported. The 2023 full year comparison shows the total reported drill projects to be 24% lower than in 2022. There was, however, an increase in early stage exploration in 2023 with an 8% increase with mine site and late stage exploration both decreasing by approximately 25% in 2022. On a discovery front, there has historically been a strong correlation between exploration budgets and significant discoveries being made. As you can see from this chart, in the gold space, global reserves are declining without significant replenishment via new discoveries. Copper discoveries are also trending down despite increasing budgets and a long-term higher price, with easier at surface major tier one style discoveries not occurring. Nickel paints a similar picture with major discoveries remaining scarce amid potential future supply deficits. Looking at the M&A space, the deal coverage was well dispersed in 2023 across gold, base and battery materials and across geographical jurisdictions. On a corporate ESG front, the increasing transparency demands and requirements from the global investment sector is resulting in higher levels of ESG reporting and ultimately performance from the sector. In summary, global mineral exploration remains strong despite a range of macroeconomic challenges to the sector. Strong battery material driven exploration has been offset by a steep decline in gold exploration. This is, however, likely to change in 2024. A gap in significant discoveries across key commodities is likely to impact future supply however does present opportunities for companies that are able to generate exploration success thank you jara i'm going to have to let, ask you to come with me to get your chocolate because they fleeced me so okay. i better behave than i thought i, I will find you a nice big gold bar of chocolate thank can you put your hands together for jara everyone thank you so much Thank you everyone who is discerning enough to stay in the room this afternoon. I hope you got some fantastic investment tips there from some of our last presenters. We'll be back tomorrow morning again at 8.30. We've got drinks going on outside at the bar for the next half an hour or so, courtesy of Gallagher. So make sure you take the opportunity and uh, have some more chats with some of our presenters. Thank you, everyone.